projection. And so the responses, a lot of the responses that we're going to be going over, these are sort of field tested. This is what we realize finally works. Right? This is what, we tried that objection, we, we figured out what, what responses Muslims have, and then we tried to make the response better, and then we heard again through, through debate or whatever, uh, we heard the responses the Muslims have, so we made the response better until we get to response, and then we get the response and then we realize, wow, you guys just shut up. You just got quiet all of a sudden. The Muslims just got quiet all of a sudden. We, now we realize, now we have a response that you cannot answer because you're changing the topic now. And so we're kind of going to give some of the, uh, some of the responses are just devastating to the Muslim objections. And so once you get these, um, you don't have to worry. You don't have to worry, um, and, and you'll, see, you'll, you'll see why. So let's just go ahead through uh, a few examples. Um, this is the most common objection you'll hear right now, and you'll hear it usually in these exact words. And the reason is some of Islam's top apologists have told Muslims to put it in these words. Some will even add in those words to the objection. So they'll say, where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me, in those words? I want those words. You've heard that, right? Sometimes you've heard that. Hundreds of times. Uh, where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me, in those words? And what's the answer? Where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me, in those words? You didn't, right? Aha, you see there? You Christians believe that Jesus is God and that you're supposed to worship him, and you don't even know where he said it. This shows you how illogical and silly Christianity is. You believe things and you don't even have evidence for them. And if you start going to some of the common passages, and I put, I put you know, right up here, think about this. This would be some of the common things that, that Christians would point out. Um, you know, Jesus claimed to be the I am of the Exodus, uh, claimed to be Lord of the Sabbath, claimed to be the apocalyptic son of man. By the way, this is not the response. I'm just telling you some of the, some of the things, some of the passages that Christians normally bring up when they're responding to uh, questions about the deity of Christ. Uh, claimed to be the Lord, King David, claimed to be greater than the temple of God, um, claimed that he could forgive sins, that the debt is owed to him, claimed to be the final judge, who's the final judge, obviously God, uh, claimed to be able to answer prayers, to be wherever his followers are gathered, to be with his followers forever. You can point all of this out. You can sit down for 20 minutes going through all these passages, and the Muslim will just say, um, no, where did he say, I am God, worship me? That's what, that's what I'm looking for. And so sometimes instead of actually just jumping in and giving, you know, giving the responses that, that, that have convinced you, uh, sometimes you have to deal with the, with the argument for a few minutes and, and deal with the response. And one of the, ways, one of the, most e one of the easiest ways to do that would be, okay, I will answer that. And Jesus would do this. I have a question for you first, and then after you answer my question, then I'll answer your question. Uh, where did he say, I'm only a prophet, don't worship me, in those words first? Where did Jesus say, I'm only a prophet, don't worship me, in those words? I want those words, no other words, and I'll let you use the Quran too. And say, you know, the Muslim can only say two things. One, he can say, Jesus didn't say that. Or he can start turning to passages of the Quran where Jesus suggests that he's just a prophet. And they say, oh, wait, but he didn't use those exact words, right? He didn't even use those exact words. So it's okay not to use exact words. What you're looking for is basically him teaching that, him teaching that he's just a prophet or something. Okay, as long as we, we've done away with the exact words right here. Sam, what, what are some of the other problems with the exact words right here? What, what, what won't Muslims find, let's say, even in the, in the Quran? No, do I need to stand or I can stand? Uh, you should stand up. We all want to see your pretty face. Oh, um, okay. Uh, did everyone, did anyone hear that? Yeah. yeah, because, you know, okay. uh, some of the things you can use to turn against Muslims, <clears throat> because what you're trying to demonstrate is that their criterion is an argument that cuts both ways. And if I can use this argument against you to discredit your religion, then mind you, you shouldn't be using that objection, unless you want to turn to atheism or agnosticism or Hinduism Whatever it is, you can't be a Muslim if you're going to be consistent and honest with this argument. So you ask a Muslim the following. <clears throat> you say, do you believe that Jesus is the virgin-born son of Mary? They'll say yes. Do you believe Jesus is the Messiah? Of course. Do you believe that Jesus is the word of Allah? And by the way, if you want those references from the Quran, <clears throat> I know I'm giving you stuff <clears throat> very fast, but let me give you some Quranic references where the Quran says that Jesus is the virgin-born son of Mary, that he's the Messiah, the word of Allah and a spirit from Him. If you're taking down notes, write down chapter 3 of the Quran, <clears throat> verses 45 to 47. Chapter 3 of the Quran, verses 45 to 47. Chapter 4 of the Quran, verse 157. Those two passages say what I just said. That Jesus is the word of Allah, a spirit from Him, the Messiah, <clears throat> right? And He was born to His blessed mother while she was a virgin. 
Now, when they agree to you, I'm sorry. Tomorrow works tonight. So again, speed. Yeah, yeah. So you got it. Or not every, not all of us have it. Your. They call him the Assyrian Encyclopedia, by the way. Because I'm shaped like a stack of encyclopedias, right? You're going down. And you're left hand there with me. Give me those references. I'll jot them down. Please, you answer. Give me those references. I'll jot them down. Chapter three, verses forty-five to forty-seven. Chapter three, verses forty-five to forty-seven. And chapter four, verse one fifty-seven. I actually, 157 is a crucifixion. Thank you for asking me the question. It's 4171. So think That's where Jesus called the Word of God. Yes, right. That's the point. This is the crucifixion, which will come later. Will come later. I'm sorry. Sometimes it can be with glitches, right? 4171. Those are the references. Now, the Muslim is going to say yes. Now, this is what you tell them. Say, can you show me? And by the way, preface your challenge. You do not believe that the Quran contains the words of Jesus. It does not contain the words of the prophets because the Quran puts in the mouths of all the prophets. Adam, Abraham, Moses, and Jesus, words that they never uttered historically. So you have to be careful using that argument, lest the Muslims say, oh, so you believe the Quran does contain their speeches. So no, for argument's sake, I'm going to presuppose that the Quran contains the words of Jesus. Now with that assumption, show me in the Quran where Jesus says, I am the word of Allah, in those exact words. Show it to me. He can't do it. Show me in the Quran where Jesus says, I am the Messiah, in those exact words. Can't do it. Doesn't say it. Show me in the Quran where Jesus says that he's a spirit proceeding from Allah. He can't find such words because Jesus never says that about himself in the Quran. Therefore, according to your criterion, Jesus can't be the Messiah, can't be the word of Allah, and can't be a spirit from him. Next, the argument. Crumbles. And so, and so the, yeah, the, the, the point there is, hey, and this will happen, oh, that right there will happen over and over and over again. A Muslim laying down, using some criterion, demanding, demanding a certain criterion, that you uh, adhere to a certain criterion when Islam itself would not, would, not, uh, would not survive that criterion. And so sometimes you have to sort of pause and say, wait a minute, before we get into evidence here, we need to examine what methodology you're using because uh, it, it, it can be all over the place. Um, so some of the some once you've clarified that once you've clarified that and say okay what we're looking for really is where Jesus made claims where he claimed to be God whether it, whether it's in the words I am God worship me or in some other words where he is claiming to where he's claiming to be something that only God can can truly claim um, and where he would where he would uh, demand worship for instance um, the problem is the problem is and this is this is what we're about to get to the problem is a lot of these Muslims will just reinterpret even if you quote them a Muslim will reinterpret them for instance if G if you say look Jesus says right here that he's going to be with with his followers wherever they're gathered right a Muslim might say well what he means is his teachings are going to be with them wherever they are so he's going to teach them and then they're going to have his teachings wherever they are you see there you see and Jesus is the final judge. Well, in Islam, we believe that Jesus is coming back. Right? Jesus is coming back. Uh, they believe in a second coming of Jesus. That Jesus is going to return and, and, uh, and there's going to be a judgment. Um, so Muslims will try and reinterpret some of these to bring them in line with an Islamic context. And one of the coolest ways, one of the coolest ways to get around this is to go to the Quran for some claims that according to Islam, only God can say. We're not using the Quran to prove Christianity. I don't believe the Quran is the word of God. I'm talking about ways to block reinterpretations. Muslims will reinterpret verses where Jesus is clearly saying something. And then so one things we one of the things we like to do is we go to the Quran, show where, according to the Quran, only Allah should be saying something. This is a claim that only Allah can make. And then and you can even add, you can say, and here's the Old Testament where Yahweh is making the same claim about himself. Say, look, according to the Bible and according to the Quran, only God can say this, right? And the Muslim has to agree. So now he's agreed ahead of time that if someone says something, this person is claiming to be God. And then, all right, now we look at the words of Jesus. Now you can't reinterpret it because no prophet is going to be tossing around these things that only God can say and applying them to himself. Uh, a, a good prophet, according to Islam, is not going to be doing that. So I'm just going to give one example here, and then Sam can fire off uh, many more. I'm giving this one just because if you're on the street and you need a very simple one, this is a simple one. This is a very simple one. So this is in the Quran, Surah 57, verse 1 through 3. And there's actually like five or six things in this passage that you could that you could apply to Jesus. We'll look at one. So Surah 57, verses 1 through 3, one of the most famous uh, descriptions of Allah in the Quran. And 
Craig was write all this down, don't worry too much about it. Just remember that uh, Surah 57, verse 3. Surah 57, verse 3. Uh, so, but we're, we're, I'm just giving the context, so making sure we're not, not taking it out of context. It says, whatever is in the heavens and on earth, let it declare the praises and glory of Allah. For he is the exalted in might, the wise. To him belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. It is he who gives life and death, and he has power over all things. He is the first and the last, the evident and the hidden, and he has full knowledge of all things. These are two of Allah, you've heard of the 99 names of Allah titles that Allah goes by. This is actually two of them. This is where two of them come from in the Quran. Allah is the first and the last. And you Christians know where we're going here. But the point is, um, instead of just quoting Jesus making the claim about himself, here you say this is actually a title of Allah here. And you can show, of course, the same thing uh, in the book of Isaiah. Thus says the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and there is no God beside me. The Muslim has no clue what said about himself. He hasn't read the Bible. And so, you know, you, you can start off by saying, hey, so this is the title of Allah. And according to the Bible, we read the same thing. And you know the New Testament says the same thing. Who's got a Bible? You got a Bible? All right, so let's, uh, let's go ahead to, you want to read for us? Sure. Okay, go to, Re go to Revelation chapter 1. Famous verse. We're saying this because this is how you would say to, to your Muslim friend. You can, uh, you, can, uh, you, can, you can let the Muslim read it for himself, in other words. Say, here, take the Bible. By the way, it also works with Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. I've used it against Jehovah's Witnesses and Muslims. If you set it up right, they're going to admit the speaker is Jehovah or Allah. And then you take it from there. Watch what happens. So in <laughs> Revelation chapter 1, in Revelation chapter 1, um, John sees a vision. And go ahead and read uh, verse 17 for us. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. And he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first. Who is this, according to Islam? You can ask your Muslim friend. Who's speaking here? Every single time the Muslim just automatically says, Allah. They say, Allah or God. right? And then you say, now go ahead and finish it. Verse 18. Uh, and the living one, I died, and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I died? Wait, you just said this was Allah. You just said this is Allah speaking, right? I didn't say it. I didn't say one word about it. I told you to read it and ask you who the speaker is, according to both the Bible and the Quran. Who's that speaking? That's Allah. And he just said he was dead and is alive forevermore. So tell me, my Muslim friend, when did Allah die? You just said he did. And of course, then you, you realize, in context, that's Jesus speaking. It's Jesus speaking. So what, no, notice what we've just done. We haven't said, here's where Jesus claims to be God. We said, here's a speaker, Muslim, who is the speaker? God. Okay, it's Jesus. You said it. You put those together. You put those together for me. So in other words, you can get the Muslim to recognize that Jesus is making a claim that only God can truly make about himself. He's the first, according to, you can read Quran commentaries on what they mean. The first, because there's nothing before him. He's the last, because there's nothing after him. And here you have Jesus using a title of Allah, applying it to himself. It's not something a good prophet should ever be doing. Now, what's interesting is you can do this with all kinds of passages. According to the Quran, Allah is the final judge. So if you, get, if, you, if, you, if you read that in the Quran and then go to the Bible where Jesus claims to be the final judge, then, you, then you've got something there. Um, what, yeah. what, which, which examples do you want to give? Because we don't have like four or five of them real quick. Yeah, this is important. Let's yeah, give you don't, four or five. You don't have them on the verses. You want to read some verses from the Quran? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chapter 22 is verses 6 to 7. I'll be, sure. I'll be your reader. Let me show you something else. Now, we can do this all day, but obviously we're pressed for time. And when you have two speakers, it makes it a little hard. You know, because when I say hard, because uh, we want to make sure we're not overwhelming you because he can spend hours just bombarding you with information I can. We don't want to do that. We want you to take stuff, remember it, and apply it for the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're going to try to make it as simple as we can because we want you to use this in evangelism. We don't want to just stay in your you know, right here in the head. We want you to use it so that Muslims get convicted and every Muslim knee bound, every Muslim knee uh, mouth confess that Jesus Christ is Yahweh to the glory of God the Father. Because we want to see everyone worship Jesus and give Him the glory that He deserves. And everyone was created by Him for Him, for His glory and pleasure. Amen? Amen? So every Muslim belongs to Jesus. They are the property of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So may God use you mightily to see everyone, especially every Muslim knee bow, and acknowledge one of who Jesus is. Now chapter 22 of the Quran, chapter 22, verses 6 to 7. This one is 
quite powerful because you're going to see the glory of Christ from a Muslim perspective. Because once you confront a Muslim with this passage, he's either going to have to admit, yes, the historical Jesus admit or claim to be God, and therefore he can't be a Muslim, or he's going to say your Bible's corrupted. Well, your Bible's corrupted anyway. It doesn't quote the words of Jesus. Oh, how convenient. At first you're asking me to prove from my Bible that Jesus claimed to be God. By attacking the integrity of the Bible, you just conceded that my Bible has Jesus claiming to be God. Thank you. At least that argument we've got out of the way. Now let's talk about the integrity of the Scriptures. Oh, as, a, as a side note, in the, in the second session today, we're going to be talking about uh, how to respond to that objection yes. to the Bible. And you should be, you should be just dying for the Muslim to ask that. <laughs> Yeah. Boy, you, he has just opened up a massive door when he says, your Bible's been corrupted. Uh, we'll, we'll get to that in a couple hours, but go ahead. In 22, 6 to 7, chapter 20, just remember chapter 22, verse 6 to 7. Now, I, that's an Abdullah Yusuf Ali translation, right? Yeah. Hopefully he translates it correct. We'll see. I don't know. So even the translations are questionable. But you're, go good, ahead. you're good, you're good. Uh, this is so because Allah is the reality. See, this is why I say translation. I know. Exactly. The actual Arabic word is al-haq. Little translation is, Allah is the truth. Don't forget that. Allah is the truth. You'll see where I'm going with this in a minute. But be that as it may continue. It is He who gives life to the dead, and it is He who has power over all things. Yep. And verily the hour will come, there can be no doubt about it, or about the fact that Allah will raise up all who are in their graves. Now remember that last part. It is Allah who will raise people from their graves. Don't forget that. And one of the names of Allah is Al-Haq in Arabic. English translation, the truth. That's what actually Haq means, the truth. Now here he translates as reality, but that's neither here nor there. Now how does this demonstrate that the historical Jesus, the Jesus of history, claimed to be God? Notice, Allah is the truth. He gives life and He will resurrect people from their graves at the last hour. Go to John chapter 5 verse 21. John chapter 5 verse 21. Right you ready there? Now, what I want you to do is read 21 all the way to 25. John 5, 21 to 25. Now, notice what Jesus claims for himself. Remember, Allah is the one who raised the dead from their graves at the last hour. And he gives life, and he is the truth. Let's see what the Lord Jesus says in the Gospel of John. John 5, the key verses will be 21, 25, and 28 to 29. 21. 25, 28 to 29. But I'm going to have to read from 21 to 25 first. Read it for me. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so the Son also gives life to whom He wishes. What we just read from the Quran, that's a prerogative belonging only to God. Allah and only Allah gives life. But Jesus says, I the Son with the Father give life to whom I am pleased to give it. Not only does this affirm that Jesus is the source of life, but that He is sovereign. It is up to him to decide who receives this life from God. Something no Muslim prophet could claim. So I'm getting excited hearing the words of Jesus. Because our Lord is risen, he is real, and he will do what he says. So praise his holy name. Muhammad is dead, he's warm food, he's under the feet of Jesus. But our Lord lives. Amen? Amen. That's the truth. Read it for me. Go ahead. For just as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, even so uh, the Son also gives life to whom he wishes. For not even the Father judges anyone, but he has given all judgment to the Son. For what reason? So that all will honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. There is the answer to the second part of the objection. Show me where Jesus says, worship me. Well, you got it right there. How do you honor Cr the Father? <clears throat> exactly. Christ says, you must honor me in the same way you honor the Father. No creature could dare, could dare exhort and command people to be given the same honor that you give God. But Jesus says... That's my Father's will. It's not even me. It's my Father demanding it of you to honor me the way you honor my Father. No creature can say that. And Christ says it because He's no mere creature. He's God in the flesh. Now continue. So that all will honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent Him. Yep, keep on. <clears throat> truly, truly, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and does not come into judgment, but has passed out of death into life. Now here it goes, verse 25. Pay attention to the words of our blessed Lord. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Sound familiar? That was chapter 22, verse 7 of the Quran. 
Allah, at the last hour, will give life and raise the dead. And it says from their graves, right? Here in verse 25, pay attention to the words of our Lord. Our Lord says, The hour is coming, and it is now, where the dead will hear whose voice? The voice of the Son of God. Now don't forget that, the voice of the Son of God. And those who hear will live. Skip to 28 and 29. Pay attention to this. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming in which all who are in the tombs will hear His voice. Whose voice in the context? The Son of God, right? Christ is claiming the prerogative to be able to resurrect not just one, but the entire dead out of their graves just at the sound of His sovereign voice. The hour is coming where those who are in their tombs will hear His voice and will come out. Now according to the Quran, these are assertions that only God can make and yet Jesus makes them. Now for those of you who are Christians, that should just cause you to jump for joy. Can you imagine the power of Jesus' voice? That at the sound of His voice, everyone in their graves comes out in attention and obedience to their Lord? That's the same voice that spoke spiritual life to our hearts. That's the same voice that spoke the entire creation into being. The same voice that sustains it, the sovereign voice of the all-powerful Son of God. This is no mere creature, this is God in the flesh. And then finally, John 14, verse 6. Remember Allah says He's the truth? Right? That's, Allah says that. Now Allah is not God, but the Muslims think He is. The true God is Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, revealed as Father, Son, Holy Spirit. But in John 14, 6, Jesus says that I am the way and the truth, one of the names of Allah, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. So everything that Allah claims for Himself, Jesus already claimed for Himself 600 years before Muhammad was born. So you can't get any clearer than that. All right, uh, and Sam, uh, no, if, uh, if Sam actually has articles where he gives, like, what? Uh, uh, oh, man. Pages. What, a dozen? Yeah. If you're, if you're like me and Sydney pizza all day, then I got tons and tons and reams of verses like this. So you can, uh, you can, Sam has, if you want them, Sam has plenty of articles where it, it's, he goes, he goes through it like that. Here's a claim Allah makes in the Quran. Here's Jesus making the same claim about himself. There are plenty of examples. In fact, if you, if you go to Google and you type in, where did Jesus say, I am God, worship me? Uh, one of my articles will pop up and uh, I, give a, I give a little outline of a lot of these claims. Um, so these are, the, 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 again, the, the, the approach here, notice it's only, it's only slightly different. These are uh, pointing out that Jesus claimed to be the first and the last. That's classic, that's classic apologetics. But by pointing out to the Muslim that you can't reinterpret that because that's something Allah says only He can say. You've just blocked their escape route. The only escape route now is Bible's been corrupted. And that's, you want them to have that as their only escape route because you can deal with that. Once you deal with that, now there's no escape route. Wait a minute, you can't say the Bible's corrupted, as we're going to see next time. You can't say the Bible's corrupted. And it's obvious what Jesus is claiming here. Now you have nowhere to go. Now there's no, now there's no way out. Now, now it's you in front of Jesus' claim, my job's done. All right, so that's one of that's one of the and again you could we could we could do three or four sessions just on uh, just on this particular objection. Where did Jesus say I am God? Worship me. We want to cover at least the ma the other major uh, objections that you're likely to encounter. And probably number two on the list would be uh, this one, which you probably heard. How can God die? Right? And, and think about think about why this makes sense, right? You Christians believe that Jesus is God. God is eternal. God is all-powerful. God has no beginning, no end. And then you turn right around. Jesus dies at the crucifixion. What sense does that make? What sense does that make? You're saying that God died. You're saying that something that has no beginning, has no end, died. And there are all kinds of variations on this. Muslims will say, how can you believe God went to the bathroom? Um, right? Something that doesn't need to go to the bathroom because it's God, yet you believe Jesus went to the bathroom. You'll see all kinds of objections like that. Uh, relating to the absurdity, it's claimed, the absurdity of saying that something that has God's attributes is doing the sort of thing that has human attributes. Now, for the Quran, this is a similar situation to what we said before, namely that you can give a response and you might give a perfectly correct response, but that later on you might realize there's a better response. There's a better response out there. So at this point, if you're talking to a Muslim and the objection, how can God die, comes up. Which is one, I mean, this, this is like top three. This is the top three. You walk out and talk to a Muslim today, there's a good chance you're going to hear this. There's a good chance you're going to hear this. You're definitely going to hear either the first or the second. You're going to hear that. Unless it's a Muslim move, oh, I don't want to hurt anyone's feelings, so I'm not even going to 
talk or something like that. It's a Muslim who, who, who is going to state his objections to you. You're going to get one of those first two, probably both. How can God die? If you had that, if you had to give that, if you had to give a response to this, most Christians would start giving, uh, you know, start talking about the incarnation and Jesus having two natures, things like that. That's perfectly correct. But the Muslim's going to either not get it or he's going to pretend not to get it. And he's just going to start talking about how absurd it is. You believe God died. You believe God died. Oh, come on, that's so silly. What are you talking about? He entered creation? That's so ridiculous. What are you talking about? Why would God do that? Why do you even need to do that? He's God. He doesn't need to do that, that sort of thing. You're taking a man and making him God, so you're saying God entered you. They're going to have a, they're going to have a big problem with that. But you can, there's a much easier way of dealing with this by once again pointing out, look, there's something you Muslims believe that just blocked all your objections to what I just said. It just blocked all of your objections. So again, here again, we're not, we're not using Islam to prove Christianity. I do not believe that's the word of God. I believe there are true statements in the Quran. Those statements were drawn from Christianity or Judaism. Um, what we're doing is, we're, the Muslim does not know. The Muslim does not know he's not supposed to be objecting, objecting to the main part of this, to, to the main idea here. Because Islam actually teaches something very similar. And once you point that out, the objection goes away. And I've done this over and over and over again with Muslims. And they bring this up. This is what they think they've got their, 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 their knockdown refutation of you. And five minutes later, let's change the subject. Let's change the subject. And they have no choice. They have no choice but to change the subject. Because if they, if they press this, they just, they just condemn their own religion. And they don't want to do that. And so here's, here's, how, here's how Sam would respond to this. Um, look what we got here. Right? So, and if, 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 you, if, if this came up in the, mid, in the middle of an argument, you say, yeah, it's actually a good question. It's a good question about how God can die. Let me think about that for a couple minutes, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get back to you. Uh, in the meantime, I have a quick question for you. Um, is this Allah's eternal word? Is this Allah's eternal word? Who knows? According to Islam, is this Allah's eternal word? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, what, 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 what would happen back in the day? If you said this is not Allah's eternal word, this has a beginning. You'd be killed. You're dead. You're a, you're, you're a heretic. You're an, they would put you in the apostate category, tell you to repent right there, or your head you would be chopped off. Um, By eternal, emphasize uncreated. Not that it was uncreated. Yeah, uncreated. Uncreated and eternal. Yeah. And just to give you a heads up where we're going, according to Islam, Allah's word proceeds hmm. from him eternally. Hmm. Now, you ask a question, right? Okay, you start asking a few questions about, uh, now sometimes, sometimes you're dealing with a Muslim who doesn't even know what he believes. Um, so you, you might need to call over one of his leaders to help him, help him get his thoughts clear and so on. Uh, you, Imam, come here for a second. Um, is the Quran eternal? Of course it's eternal. So, so the word of Allah is eternal. Yes, absolutely. Does the word of Allah have a beginning? No. Does the word of Allah have an end? No. Can the word, uh, can Allah's word be corrupted? Absolutely not. We're going to be talking about that next time. Allah's words cannot be corrupted. Uh, can Allah's word be corrupted? No. Can they be destroyed? No. Okay, so Allah's word has no beginning, has no end, uncreated, incorruptible. Is that correct? Yeah. Well, I, I opened my Quran here. Uh, 2011. Publication date. Th this Quran has no beginning? When Terry Jones, that guy down in Florida, burned the Quran, he didn't destroy it. He didn't destroy a Quran. What was he, what was he burning there? Was that a Quran or not? So this Quran had a beginning. It will eventually fall apart. It's made of paper and glue and ink. Paper and glue and ink, by definition, will eventually fall apart. So, what are you talking about when you say the Quran's eternal? I don't understand. <laughs> this has a beginning. This is corruptible. This will eventually fall apart. Fall apart. This has an ending. How can you say this is eternal? And Muslims don't know this, and that's where we come in. <laughs> Islamic, in Islamic theology, the Quran has two natures. The Quran <coughs> has two natures. Sound familiar? It is Allah's eternal, uncreated, incorruptible, timeless word. But when it enters creation, it enters in a physical form made of paper and glue and ink or written on the hearts of people who have memorized it. But it always has a physical medium. Now, so you say to your Muslim friend, aha, now I think I understand. The eternal, uncreated, incorruptible word of Allah enters creation 
as a physical Quran made of paper and glue and ink, since the eternal word of Allah has entered into creation made of paper and glue and ink, now it can be destroyed. But if this physical Quran were destroyed, you wouldn't say that Allah's eternal word was destroyed, right? You don't believe that when Terry Jones burned a copy of the Quran that Allah's eternal word was burned, right? You don't believe that, right? They go, no, 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 no. Mm. Oh, okay. okay. Thank you for clarifying that for me. Now let's get back to your objection to Christianity. Let's start reading at uh, John 1. So let me get started. In the beginning was the Word. Mm -hmm. The Word was with God. The Word was God. And then you get down. And the Word became flesh. What was your objection to my belief that something that is eternal, uncreated, incorruptible can enter creation in a physical form, and that since it has a physical form, that physical form can be destroyed, and yet it wouldn't affect the, it would, it would destroy the eternal, the eternal nature? What was your objection to that? Objection gone, right? I've never brought that up until the objection continued. <laughs> And you can't because any condemnation, any saying, well, your view is silly, your view is ridiculous, you, they just condemned Islam. And they're heretics now. They don't want to do that. So, well, and then they go back to where, you know, Jesus didn't make that claim, or Jesus didn't claim to be God, or something like that. But notice, that's sort of the difference between, that's sort of the difference between, you know, trying to explain Christian theology to someone who doesn't want to understand it and just wants to attack it, and just, just destroying their most common objection, right? One of, their, one of their three or four most common objections, right? And notice, there's nothing very difficult about that. There's nothing that anyone in this room couldn't do. And so these are the sorts of, this is why, you know, this, again, these are, these are field tested. These are field tested. Keep throwing them, keep, we keep responding to Muslim objections until something sticks and they don't have a response. And we say, okay, now we're gonna go teach everyone that. <laughs> and so this is one of them where, this is one of the main objections. If this would just, if, you know, if responses to these basic questions, it doesn't, and it, it doesn't have to be this, we're, just give, we're giving you an example of something that, that has worked for us. There are other responses out there, there are other Christian apologists who would, have, uh, who would have other responses and so on. The point is getting a response to a common objection and making it so that Christians know it. Because if Muslims only have five or six objections that they are, that they are putting out as, as their main objections, then if they start getting responses, Guess what? That Muslim's been told you don't have a response to this. He's been taught all his life you cannot respond to this objection. You cannot respond to where did Jesus say I am God worshiping. You have no response. The Muslim walks up to you and finds you've got responses. Wow, my leader's been telling me wrong all along. What else have these guys been telling me wrong about? Maybe I need to maybe I need to think through this uh, think through this a bit more. Okay, so as far as the deity of Christ, those are your main two objections. You get those down. You get those down. That's what you're going to hear. Uh, how can God die? Where did Jesus say, I am God worshiping? Again, there are plenty more responses. We wanted to cover a couple of quick examples. So, as far as, uh, as, far as where did Jesus say, I am God worship me? Sam can give you 5,000 Bible and Quran references and tie those all together. If you just wanted to learn a couple of verses, right? And that's not too much. Um, 57.3 of the Quran. 57.3 of the Quran. You can tie that into Isaiah 44.6. And tie that into Revelation 1, 17 to 18. You memorize three verses to respond to the most common Muslim objection in the world. It's not, it's not, it's not too bad. And here, you don't even need to learn any, refer I mean, any references for this. Um, but that's the main two objections you'll ever hear from a Muslim. Very easy to respond to. And just the fact that you're responding to any of this is going gonna, is gonna to shock the Muslim. Again, you've been taught you can. All right, now we want to get into a couple um, objections to the doctrine of the Trinity in particular. Do we have any questions before we, before we go on to doctrine of the Trinity? What time are we supposed to finish? 12.15. 12.15, okay. Uh, any questions on this so far? Yeah? Um, could you give us some like references for like... Real quickly. Actually, you can actually use that. We did that on the live Jesus or Muhammad show. Some of you follow us from Jesus or Muhammad. <clears throat> actually, we had a chef call in. I actually used the same logic that they, they use to prove the Quran is uncreated to prove that Jesus is uncreated. A chef. Chef, a Muslim scholar. That's this, and that's this verse right here. Yeah. What happened? He had to say yes. Actually, he says it. It's a short clip. Someone uh, took it and made a short clip on YouTube. I said, chapter 4, 171. Chapter 3, verse th uh, 39. Chapter 3, verse 45. Jesus is called Allah's word, right? He goes, yes. You were there, actually. It was you and Joseph. I know. We all high-fived each other. Yeah. <laughs> so praise the Lord. Amen. You're one step closer to being a Someone Christian. Someone put it on YouTube and, and, and time out something like Muslim Shaykh gets owned yeah. or something like this. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I asked him. I go, okay, so Jesus is Allah's word, right? He goes, yeah. Allah's word created or uncreated? Uncreated. 
So now, if Jesus is Allah's word, you just proved that Jesus is uncreated. Thank you. Hey. And we heard birds chirping in the background. Chir, chir. <laughs> Notice that these are these are these are these are not these are not difficult. These are not dif they're not difficult objections. They're not difficult uh, responses. Um, the difficulty, I, I think, one of the main difficulties lies in that here in in America, that apologetics has has grown up in an environment where you know we're worried about responding to atheists or maybe Mormons are Jehovah's Witnesses or something like that. Meanwhile, there's 1.6 billion Muslims out there and that hasn't been a big emphasis. And if it had been, these are very easy responses for, for, for Christians to learn. Um, and so this is, this is you know, again, on the, on the downside, we haven't been doing it. On the upside, it's not, it's not a tremendously difficult task. All right, uh, anything else before we go on to the Trinity? Yeah. On the, when you brought up the uh, point about the first and the last and they tied it to Revelation, mm -hmm. in my experience, like, until you show that Jesus was crucified and raised, you'll say, well, this is, you know, the resurrected Jesus saying this in Revelation, so I don't accept that. Don't accept raised, what? That he was raised. So if you, you think if it was in the Gospel of John, he'd accept it? Mm -hmm. uh, well, if no matter where you show it, he's not going to accept it. Yeah, that's, that's true. Yeah. Says it. Yeah, <laughs> and, and by the way, we're, 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 we're going to... We should address it here. I'll address it quickly here. Um, and this is this is going to tie in to what the Quran teaches about the Bible, and we're going to see later on. Uh, according to the Quran, and most Muslims, I don't know where Muslims got reputations of people who have memorized their entire book. There are Muslims who have done that. Ninety-nine percent of the Muslims you'll run, run into have no clue what's in that book. It's very believe what you're told to believe by your leaders. Don't question it. That's the vast majority of Muslims. They have no clue what's in there. Which, which gives you an excellent opportunity because now you can give him a little education about what's in his book. The Quran affirms, as we're going we're to focus on next time, the Quran affirms the inspiration, preservation, and authority of the Christian scriptures. As far as, uh, as, far as uh, uh, something like Revelation, where, see, the Quran repeatedly affirms the gospel, right? So it refers to the gospel. So in the Gospels, you're as good as gold. If a Muslim tries to get away from anything in the Gospels, you're, you're, you're going to be able to hammer them. It's, a, it's kind of an extra step to say something like the book of Revelation, but you can do it uh, according to 6114 of the Quran. And don't worry about writing that. We'll, we're going to include that later. But according to 6114, 6114 of the Quran, um, the true followers, basically, the true followers of Jesus won. The true followers of Jesus, in the battles over theology and other things, the true followers of Jesus won. And so what they passed on, the message they passed on, that is the one. And it's not just that they won by, by chance. Allah held Jesus' true followers until, it says, until they became uppermost. So the Christians that actually became uppermost, according to Islam, are the ones that Allah was helping. So guess what? The Christians who put this together, these are the ones who became uppermost. You can't appeal to some random heretical sect that was crushed a long, long time ago. And say that's the true that's the true Christianity of Jesus. If that's the true Christianity of Jesus, that didn't become uppermost. This became uppermost. So according to in another, the Quran puts this as like it, it's it's these teachings about the power of Allah. These people try to get these people try to, to stop Jesus and they can't. Allah Allah protects Jesus followers. He promises to protect Jesus followers. And then he does until their their message dominates. And it's the same thing with corrupting Allah's word. You can't corrupt it. It's that's part of Allah's power is that no one can change or alter exactly. his words. Well, what that means is, if what the Muslim is saying is true, those verses of the Quran aren't true. The Muslim says, oh, uh, the Bible's been corrupted. Well, the Quran says no one can corrupt Allah's word. So I guess Allah isn't as powerful, according to you. Allah isn't as powerful as you're saying, right? And Allah said he helped the true followers of Jesus until they became uppermost. Well, these Christians became uppermost. If these aren't the true Christians here, then Allah was wrong, right? Okay, so according to you, I have to reject the Quran, right? That you, you could just go there, and, and so once again, once again, again, Muslims don't know what they, they don't they, they've never thought about the Quran having two natures. It's it's official Islamic theology. They've never thought about it, and how their objections to Christianity would refute Islam. Similarly, they haven't thought about how their objections to the Bible, if they take them seriously, would refute Islam. They don't know. They've been taught here's how you attack Christianity, not here's how those same objections would apply to Islam. Um, and so, if they accept the claims of the Quran concerning the Bible. They can't be Muslims. They have to reject Allah and embrace Yahweh, His Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So either way, they're in a dilemma they can't come out of. Yeah, that's the Islamic. That's the Islamic dilemma. We're going to be talking about the Islamic dilemma. So either way, they lose. Um, but but just 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 so just Jesus me, is victor. Amen. Just 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 to add, sometimes sometimes in a response you might be 
uh, anticipating what the Muslim is going to say, and then sort of baiting him into saying that, right? Um, so with that, with that example, just to tell you another direction you could go in, if you quoted 50, uh, sir, 57, 1 through 3, and showed the Muslim what it says, and then you go to Revelations 1, and if the Muslim says, I don't believe that, right? So you can you you point out no one can corrupt Allah's word, you can point out the true followers of Jesus 1, um, but sometimes I might not even go there, I might just say, oh, okay, I shouldn't trust the book of Revelation, why not? Well, it came, it was long after, and then, oh, okay. So I shouldn't trust someone who came a long time, some book that's a long time after a book that's been disputed, right? Okay. So, so now, when was this Quran? <laughs> when did this Quran come along, right? In other words, you've got you've got John, you've got John saying, "Hey, I received this, this I received these revelations about Jesus." Oh, you can't believe that! But I'm supposed to believe Muhammad, who came along much later. Ah, I received these revelations about Jesus. Well, I know why I should believe John. I don't know why I should believe Muhammad, right? Um, the, what, the Book of Revelation. That's part. That's part of. That's part of the Christian canon, right? That, this, there's a history behind it. There's a connection. There's a connection to the actual Jesus. This has no connection. This is a different. This is a, this is a different country. Over five centuries later, different language. There's no connection. So, so uh, you know whether whether we go whether we go back to what the Quran says about the Bible or not. Uh, you can always you can always use that as a springboard into now let's now let's talk about your book because you just said you're not going to trust this book of this book of mine. Mm -hmm. Following your same objection, all the more, I should never trust this. I should never trust your book right now, so why should I trust it? And tomorrow we're actually going to be trust exactly. addressing the things that they're going to they're going to say in response to that. You want to just give a minute to stretch out? Just one minute to stretch? I don't want to take you guys a want to stretch out? Take a minute to stretch out? Stand up and stretch? Because I know David could put people to sleep, so I want to. <laughs> all right, I'm going to take a minute to stretch break. Stretch out. I know Sam's been talking to you to death. You probably <laughs> zoned out. I'm not, I'm no, just just want to to Christianity uh, are going to involve the deity of Christ, and you just looked at the main two. You can handle the main two. That's what you're going to run into. Um, Muslims might, might press various issues. If you, if you stick to your guns, uh, they're, they're, they're not going to be able to get an inch of progress, especially later on today when we had the Islamic dilemma. There's, there's, there's just nowhere to go. Um, and I keep, I, I, I've brought this up in debates where I still think there's got to be some response to this out there, and I just bring it up. This guy didn't have any response at all. He's a debater. If, 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 if a popular Muslim debater cannot respond to a simple objection, I guarantee you the guy you run into on the street is not going not gonna to have a response. Uh, so deity of Christ, deity of Christ, and next, of course, would be the Trinity. We're going to look at uh, three quick ones. They're all kind of related. Um, but one, it's kind of common for Muslims just to say, uh, hey, I, uh, I opened the Bible. The Bible doesn't even use the word Trinity. I actually went to uh, ISNA, the Islamic Society of North America. They have their uh, national meeting. And my friend Emil and I walked in there and we went to, we saw a meeting called Dawah Task Force. Dawah, that's their sort of Muslim preaching and so on. Like, I wonder what they're saying in the Dawah Task Force meeting. So uh, we went and sat down and saw what, you know, how the Muslims are being trained to approach Christians and what, what they're taught. And this is, the guy teaching was the guy who runs the Why Islam campaign. I don't know how big it is in Chicago, but I live in New York. It's all over the subways, right? You're driving, you're riding the subway, there's signs everywhere. Why Islam? Contact this, uh, contact this website and so on. Um, but their training is, you tell your Christian to show you where the word Trinity is in the Bible. Show them the word Trinity. <laughs> Trinity. Um, you can't. You see, the Bible doesn't even teach the Trinity. So there's it, two, you know, there's two kind of two things you can mean. One, you can have this really horrible objection, which this guy was using, um, that the, you know, the word Trinity isn't in there. But uh, you know, a more serious objection is the Bible doesn't actually teach the doctrine of the Trinity. It doesn't teach the concept of the Trinity. So, Sam, you want to respond to that? Well, there are two other main objections that Lord willing, David Wood is going to also engage that the Trinity is a logical contradiction, right? and that it consists of three gods. Those are also important because they always come up. Now let me just real quickly <clears throat> refute that first objection, which is, and I laugh because it's, it's pathetic. But, uh, you know, and I've heard it from Joe's witnesses. Before Muslims raised that objection against me, Joe's witnesses were the first to show, tell me the word Trinity does not appear in the Bible. In fact, most of the objections against the Trinity and the deity of Christ are taken from Jehovah Witness material. So when you learn to refute Islam, you're going to learn by the grace of God to refute several groups at the same time. You're going to learn how to interact with liberal attacks on the Bible. You're going to learn how to, uh, to deal with uh, questions of mistakes in the Bible. So you're going to have to learn how to deal with inerrancy, which is an issue brought up by atheists and agnostics. When it comes to the Trinity, you're going to learn how to deal with Joe's Witnesses and Mormons and Unitarians 
because Muslims take arguments from all these different fields, combine them together and present them in a uniquely Muslim context with the hopes to get you to doubt uh, Christianity and become a Muslim. So that objection, where is the word Trinity in the Bible? Again, remember the objection that I stated earlier. If I can turn your own argument against you, then your argument can't be good, now can it? And if you're going to be consistent, and if that argument can be used against your position, then why are you still a Muslim? If you're going to be consistent, abandon Islam. Don't be a Christian, don't be a Muslim, be an atheist, agnostic, and you name it. But you can't be a Muslim because these are the very reasons why you're not a Christian. Reasons that I'm using now more forcefully against your position. So you always want to bring them back, back to that point. Now, the term used to denote Islamic Unitarianism, and I'm not trying to use fancy terms here, but there's a distinction in monotheisms. You as a Christian, you are a Trinitarian monotheist. right? Fancy terms, right? Trinitarian monotheist. Muslims are Unitarian monotheists. Now, can someone tell me what the difference is? They are Unitarian monotheists, we're Trinitarian monotheists. What's the difference? Someone tell me. The difference between being a person. You got it. I like that. You must be listening to James White. Yeah, yeah I knew it, man. That's my favorite heretic, you know that? But you can't hold a candlestick next to William Craig. Oh, I'm just kidding. Oh, that's a bad word here in Reform Circles. No, I'm just kidding. Play with you. So now, elaborate what you mean being in person. What's the difference between a Unitarian and a Trinitarian? A Trinitarian believes in um, God, God, having, God having a nature in uh, one being with three persons. Okay. And, and then the Muslim is what? One being one person. Exactly. So we're both monotheists, but they're Unitarians and we're Trinitarians, right? Now the term in Arabic for Islamic Unitarianism is Tawheed. Now it's variously spelled, right? I mean it's spelled either T-A-U-H-I-D or T-A-W-A-H-I-D, depending on which Muslim publication, they'll spell it differently. Be that as it may, the word is Tawheed. Now, remember what the objection was. Since the word Trinity is not in the Bible, therefore the Bible doesn't teach it, right? Well, guess what? The word Tawheed is not in the Quran. Therefore, according to your logic, the Quran doesn't teach Tawheed. It doesn't teach Islamic Unitarianism. That means Islam must be teaching polytheism, according to your logic. Now, which Muslim would accept that reason? I said, well, the term doesn't have to be there, as long as the concept is taught. Oh, I see. So it's no longer whether the term appears, it's whether the scripture teaches what that term entails, precisely. So now let's get to the heart of the matter. Does the Bible teach what the Trinity entails? Now before I get into some of the verses, now I can't spend too much time, <clears throat> you know, like I said, and I'm not exaggerating, either David or I can spend hours giving you evidence upon evidence. But before I give you just some examples from the New Testament, as well as the Old Testament if I had time, if you want evidence from the Old Testament, ask me. A lot of people like to restrict their testimony to the New Testament. I belong to an old school that believes you can actually demonstrate God's triunity from the Old and New Testaments together. And, and, and before Christianity, there were some rabbis that thought the same. You got it, exactly. This is actually an ancient tradition. If you, write, you read the writings of the church fathers, if you read, let's say, the writings of Justin, uh, Justin Martyr, you read Irenaeus or Tertullian, they're not just quoting the New Testament to prove that God is a plurality of divine persons. They're actually quoting the Old Testament and bombarding their opponents with Old Testament citations demonstrating that even the prophets of the Old Testament knew that God was multi-personal. So if you want some of those references, ask me. So I'm getting a smile on my face. I just love going back to the Old Testament, the foundation of the New Testament, because I love meat. <laughs> you can see I'm not a vegetarian by any means, right? <laughs> But because my time is fleeting, let me just look at some New Testament references. But before I do that, someone define, define for me the Trinity. What does the Trinity mean? Uh, it's three persons, one essence. Exactly. So one essence, one being, three persons. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Now, do we find anywhere in the Bible where we're taught that God is one, but at the same time, there are three distinct persons, specifically the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are personally distinct, yet all of them together exist as one God. Yes, it does. Now, it doesn't say it in those exact words, but the data is there. Let's go to Matthew 28. Let's look at Matthew 28, 16 to 20. <clears throat> Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Now, if I had sufficient time, I could break this down, but again, I'll try to do justice to the passage. There's like eight different things in this passage. Yeah, there is, but I won't be able to go into all eight of it. So, Matthew 28, 16 to 20. Let's just, I'll read it out loud because it's on the screen. <clears throat> As the Lord Jesus anoints us to glorify Him by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
But the eleven disciples proceeded to Galilee, to the mountain which Jesus had designated. <clears throat> when they saw him, they worshipped him. What? That, that's a no-no. See, that's why he said what? According to Islamic theology, no God-fearing Muslim prophet can accept anyone worshipping him or her. And yet here, Christ is worshipped without rebuking them for, do, for doing so. But some were doubtful. Now ask me a little later on what it means that some were doubtful. Like I said, I don't have too much time, but we'll open up a few minutes for Q&A. And if you want to know what this passage means, ask me and I'll try to answer it to the best of my ability, by the grace of God. Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Now do me a favor, Dave, we're going to have to do two things at one time real quickly. Can you go to chapter 3 of the Quran, verse 189, and read it out loud? Chapter 3, verse 189. Now pay attention to what Jesus says. Jesus says to the disciples, all authority, everywhere, in the entire creation belongs to me. All authority everywhere in the entire creation, heavens and earth, belongs to me, the Son of God. Now read chapter 3, verse 189 of the Quran. What does it say there? <clears throat> to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. To who? Allah. Sorry. Belongs what again? The dominion of the heavens and the earth. But Jesus says, the entire dominion of the heavens and earth belongs to me. Well, according to the Quran, this is a claim that only God can make, and yet Jesus made it. So what does this tell us about the consciousness of the historical Jesus? He believed that he was God. More specifically, the Divine Son, the same from the Father, and the Holy Spirit. Now I'll come back to all authority given to him in a moment. Let's continue though. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name, singular, notice it's singular, of the Father, and more literally it should be, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Now let's park it right there. <clears throat> According to the biblical worldview, when you speak of someone's name, you're speaking of their authority, their essence, and characteristics. Now, again, in the 21st century, names really don't have much meaning. Like, you know, if you call someone Tom, you're just calling them Tom because you like Tom. Or David, maybe because, I don't know, maybe you're named after... If I tell you my name, you probably laugh. Hasamo. That's actually my Middle Eastern name. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that. <laughs> I'll, I'll be more Christ-like than you and turn the other cheek. <laughs> and I'll be humble about doing it too. <laughs> in, the, in the Bible, names have significance because names convey something about the person. It tells us something about the person. Either their characteristic, their nature and essence. When Jesus says, name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, basically Jesus is saying that He and the Spirit together with the Father possess the same nature and characteristics. Now you can show a Muslim, this is, this is a significant statement by asking them the following. Ask a Muslim the following. Could you ever say as a Muslim, in the name of Allah, and Muhammad, and Gabriel? They'll say that's blasphemy. Could you ever say, in the name of Allah, and the Messenger, and the Holy Spirit, which they believe to be the angel Gabriel, by the way. For those of you who are not aware, according to Islamic theology, <coughs> the Holy Spirit is angel Gabriel. He's not the third person of the Godhead. He's the, <coughs> the angel of Revelation, Gabriel. A Muslim will say that is utter blasphemy to say in the name of Allah and His Messenger and Gabriel. That's blasphemy. Well, if Jesus is a good Muslim, what in the world is He doing saying in the name of the Father, which happens to be my name and the Spirit's name at the same time? Does this sound like a Muslim Jesus or the Jesus of Christian faith, the God of all creation? Let's continue. <clears throat> Teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo... I am with all of you. Now here you can't tell in the English, but if you go back and read the Greek New Testament, the word you is plural, meaning all of you. I am with all of you, not sometime, all the time, till the end of the age. Now let me ask everyone a question here. <clears throat> Jesus is giving this promise in the context of commanding the disciples to make disciples of all nations. What's the significance of a statement? His reassuring them that he just gave them. Think about it. I'm in presence, he has to be everywhere. Exactly, but related to that, he's giving them that promise to reassure them. Reassure them for what? Uh, for when they go out into the nations, because even after he's dead, and resurrected, and rises. And, and so he's going to be with them wherever they go, right? In other words, he's basically guaranteeing them that no matter what happens, you will be successful, because I'm with you, guaranteeing your mission. Mm -hmm. you understand the promise of Jesus? It's a claim to sovereign power. Don't worry about where you go. I'm with you, guaranteeing the success of your mission. Wherever you are at. So if Paul, you end up in China, and Peter is in Rome, I'm with both of you at the same time, making sure that no one stops you 
from accomplishing my will. That's a claim not just to omnipresence, but to omnipotence. In order for Christ to guarantee the success of their mission, no matter who comes up against them, if the entire world came up against them, Jesus says, don't worry about it. I have overcome the world. I am with you. Don't be afraid. Only God can make that claim because only, only God is omnipresent, omniscient, and omnipotent. So right here you see the Trinity affirmed by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now if you have questions on this, I'll, I'll open up the questions in a, in a few minutes. And you can ask me to elaborate. If there's a point you'd like me to elaborate, let me know. But I want to go to the next passage. This time is fleeting. Another passage that just shouts the Trinity. If you properly understand and exegete the passage. This right here shouts Trinity. If you understand the implications of what Paul says here under inspiration of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12, 3-7. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus is accursed. <clears throat> And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. Right there, that's a powerful passage. In fact, God used this passage to lead me to the belief in the total depravity of man and unconditional election. That one passage, that's a passage that God used. Because it says, apart from the Spirit, you cannot confess Jesus as Lord. Well, if you cannot confess Jesus as Lord, you can't get saved. So the Spirit has to regenerate and enable you to make that confession in order to get saved. That's a passage that the Lord used to bring me on this journey. Of the heretical doctrines of grace. Not Jesus. <laughs> okay? So it's the work of the Holy Spirit. It's a sovereign work of the Holy Spirit. To enable someone to make the saving, saving confession. Now the Holy Spirit does it for all the people of God. At all times. No matter where they're at. What kind of characteristics must the Holy Spirit have. In order to be able to, to do it for all the people of God. No matter where they're at. What kind of characteristics? He's got to be omnipresent. Right? Can't be limited to time and space. If it's the work of the Holy Spirit for all Christians everywhere to believe and confess, then the Holy Spirit has to be present where all believers are at the same time. So He must be omnipresent. He must be omnipotent. Now let's, let's continue. Now watch this. There are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. <clears throat> and there are varieties of ministries and the same Lord. There are varieties of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons... But to each one is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. Now if you continue reading 8 to 11, you'll see the various gifts that the Holy Spirit in His own sovereignty gives to each individual member of the body of Christ. The gift of knowledge, the gift of prophecy, the gift of healing, etc., etc. According to 1 Corinthians 12, 7 to 11, all these operations, all these gifts are the works of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit together. You guys see it? <clears throat> Variety of ministries and the same Lord. In context, who's that Lord? Variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. That's the Holy Spirit. But then notice the, the, the third, third uh, part. There are a variety of effects, but the same God who works all things in all persons. So here's my question to all of you. What kind of characteristics must the Father and the Son and the Spirit have in order to be able to give different gifts to different members of the body of Christ, no matter where they're at, and then enable them to carry out those gifts successfully for the glory of God. What kind of characteristics? They must be omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. But that's true of all three. The Spirit, the Lord, and God, all three of them together are omnipresent, omnipotent, right? And omniscient. Now someone read for me verse 11. He didn't quote it for some reason. But someone read for me 1 Corinthians 12, 11. Because I want to show you something here. This is proof that the Holy Spirit is a divine person. Contrary to what uh, <clears throat> Joe's witnesses will tell you, the Holy Spirit is a divine person because He has the characteristics of personhood. In verse 11, what does it say about the Holy Spirit? All these are by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He will. Catch it again? One more time? All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as He will. Who, who wills? He's Who's he? He's God. You're not reading carefully, my brother. You're right. Technically, it's God. But which All person is God? Empowered by one and the same Spirit who portions to each one individually as He wills. So who's He again? Jesus. Each one. In the You're hurting me, man. I'm about to lose spirit. lose sleep right here. In context, the He rever refers back to who? The same Spirit. The Spirit is not Jesus, and He's not God the Father. This is why I say, if you understand the context, you'll see the implications clearly. So, who wills, who decides, which member of the body of Christ gets what gift? 
the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit cannot have volition or will if the Holy Spirit is not a person. Now can He? But here the Holy Spirit has volition, has will, and He decides in perfect unit the Father and the Son. So in this short section of Scripture, you see the Holy Spirit is a divine person, and with the Father and the Son is omnipresent, omniscient, omnipotent. What else does the Bible need to say to convince people that this book is a Trinitarian book? Final example for the sake of time, right? We only went with three. 2 Corinthians 13, 14. I often get this, uh, this question asked. Can we pray to the Holy Spirit? Have you had that question asked of you? Can you pray to the Holy Spirit? How about can we pray to the Son directly? Now let me just feel uh, the audience. How many of you believe you can pray to the Son directly? How many of you think, no, you should only pray to the Father in the Son's name? Good. Because there are some among us, uh, Refor Camp, that think they should only pray to the Father in the name of the Son. One such scholar is Bruce Ware. Bruce Ware, who's a solid Christian, solid theologian, Trinitarian, believes that you should only pray to the Father in the name of the Son. That's not true. According to the New Testament, you can pray to the fa Father in Jesus' name, or you can pray to Jesus directly. If you want those references, ask me a little later. But here you see, this is what we call, what would, what would we call this? Paul is ending his epistle with a prayer. What would we call this? What's the technical term for this? Benediction. Say it again. Benediction. What is a benediction? A good word. Alright. Be more specific. Of course it's a good word. Well, in a benediction, when you're ending, let's say, your service, what are you doing? You're invoking God to bless the congregation, right? Is it invocation prayer? Yes. So now, who is Paul invoking to bless the Christians at Corinth? Three divine persons. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. This is a Trinitarian benediction. He's invoking Christ to pour out His grace upon all believers. Invoking God the Father to fill them with His love for one another and for Him. And also invoking the Holy Spirit to create perfect, sweet fellowship among the members of the body of Christ. So this is a Trinitarian benediction which requires a Trinitarian God to do the things that Paul is asking the Lord Jesus, God the Father, and the Holy Spirit to do. Now, if I had more time, I could give you more examples. But again, for the sake of time, I'm going to stop there and allow you to answer the other two objections. Because I know you need a lot of attention, so we want to give it to you. <laughs> All right, so and by, the, by the way, um, if you can answer that part, if you can answer that part, namely showing that the Bible does teach the Trinity, that's actually enough, because when you combine that with what we're going to look at in the next session, namely that Muslims have to follow what's in the Bible, uh, then you can any doctrine you can defend from the Christian scriptures, you can say, now too bad you're not allowed to back away from that, or you're going against the Quran. And so you don't actually need to respond to these other objections, we just thought we'd toss them in there. Um, because they, they come up a lot. But, but just keep in mind, anything you can defend from the Bible, you, you, can, you can corner the Muslim on it by, by using what, what, what we're going to call the Islamic dilemma. Um, belief in the Trinity is belief in three gods. And just by knowing what the doctrine, what the definition of the Trinity is, we've already covered that, you know, that's, that's not correct. But what's interesting is why Muslims think that. And in the Quran, you have repeated condemnations of the Trinity, saying don't say three, saying Christians believe that uh, Allah is the third of three, which has never been a Christian definition of the Trinity. But the closest that Islam ever comes to defining the Trinity is right here. It's a good verse to know from the Quran. Not memorize it, but know the reference. Surah 5, verse 116. It's talking about on the judgment day, Allah is going to be talking to Jesus. It says, and when Allah will say, O Isa, son of Mary, that's Jesus, son of Mary, did you say to man, take me and my mother for two gods besides Allah? He will say, glory be to thee, it did not befit me that I should say what I had no right to say. If I had said it, thou wouldst indeed have known it. Thou knowest what is in my mind, and I do not know what is in thy mind. Surely thou art the great knower of the unseen things. Muslims believe, often, some, some Muslims actually have in, interactions with Christians and, and have a better idea of what we believe, but many Muslims that you run into, but they don't know a lot of Christians, 
They think that when we say Father, Son, and so on, that we believe in a trinity made up of God, Jesus, and Mary. <laughs> a doctrine that no Christian group, heretical or not, has ever believed. Now, the, why this is important, I mean, so, so think about it. Isa. Me and my mother as two gods besides Allah. And Jesus, Jesus denies it. Um, why this is important is this. Now, the Quran is trying to refute the doctrine of the Trinity. I can understand why a 7th century caravan trader would misunderstand the doctrine of the Trinity when he hears Christians saying Father, Son, and Jesus, Son of Mary, right? They hear Jesus, Son of Mary, Jesus, Son of God, God the Father. Oh, that's what they mean when they keep saying the word Trinity as well. I understand why a 7th century caravan trader in Arabia would misunderstand that. I don't understand how Allah would not know what we teach, right? point there? This is a massive theological blunder. Uh, if this is the word of Allah, then even though Allah is refuting what we believe, I would at least expect Allah to know what, what it is that we believe in the process of refuting it. When he totally misrepresents what we believe, doesn't even get it, doesn't even get it right, and says, well, Christians believe in the truth, that should be, that should be a clue. That whoever the author of the Quran actually is doesn't even know what Christians believe. And so this is, this is the Muslim belief, the Muslim belief about what Christians believe about the Trinity, it actually can be flipped back. No, this is a problem for you guys, because this is a problem for your theology, because your God doesn't even know what we believe, right? Um, and what you actually think that we believe is something we've never believed. When we say Jesus is the Son of God, we mean there, there are various meanings of that in Scripture. Um, one of them is not this. Nope, we've never, we've never taught this. So the one thing we don't mean when we say Jesus is the Son of God is exactly what your book says is what we mean by the term Son of God. Uh, you guys have the problem here, not us. Um, but as far as the objection goes, and let me go ahead and click on the next because there, there are basically different forms of the, the same objection. Um, the other is that it's a contradiction to say that God is three in one. Say that, that the God is, you know, because of the common formulation. So one, Muslims will say that belief in the Trinity is actually polytheistic. You believe in three gods. And that's exactly what you would uh, believe about Christians if you read the Quran. And the other is that even if you carefully explain what you mean, it's a, it's a kind of contradiction. Now when people say things like this, they don't even know what a contradiction is. Right? If, if we said God is one in being and three in being, you've got a contradiction on your hands. God is one in person and three in person, well, that would, you would have a contradiction on your hands, right? Contradict, saying that, that's, that's what a contradiction is. Uh, saying of the same thing that is true and false at the same time in the same sense. Are we saying that God is three in the same sense that he is one? No. No, no, no Christian has maintained that. And so that right there rules out the, rules out the entire um, claim of contradiction. We say God, what we're saying is that God is one in one sense and more than one in another sense. Now, how you can sort of get to the, you know, maybe help the Muslim to, to understand this, um, is Muslims actually believe something similar about Allah. And not, 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 not that Allah is a trinity or something like that, although you've got some stuff. Yeah, actually, yeah, yeah. That. yeah. We, we, if we've got some time, we'll, we'll, we'll go into that. Some very interesting stuff about Corrupt Allah. The trinity, yeah. Yeah. There's, there's some very interesting stuff about Allah sending Allah in the Quran. Very, very, very strange stuff. Um, but but something, you know, something that's, that's kind of simple to point out is Muslims believe that Allah is one in one sense and more than one in another sense uh, in terms of Allah's attributes, right? They believe that God is one in essence or nature, and they believe that Allah is more than one in, uh, in his attributes. But what's interesting is that in Islam, Allah's attributes are actually in conflict with each other. So Muhammad said that Allah says uh, uh, that his, uh, his mercy triumphs over his wrath. So Allah's wrath wants to punish, but his mercy overcomes it. Well, is Allah's mercy the same thing as his wrath? There's justice? Now, two totally different things. Wait a minute. So there's, there's a distinction within God, right? There is a distinction within God. There's Allah's mercy and his wrath. Um, they're both part of the same essence, and yet there's a distinction within God. Well, there, you have, there you've got a contradiction, right? You're saying that God is one in one sense and more than one in another sense. He's one in essence or nature, and he's more than one in attribute. Therefore, Islam is silly and refutes itself, right? 
And the Muslim is going to say no. Of course not, right? Of course. When we're talking about the level of attributes, we're talking about the level of attributes that's different from the level of being or nature or essence. Exactly, I agree. I agree completely. And so what, 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 you know, what we're trying to say is, is, as Christians is, yes, we have the level of being, yes, we have the level of attributes, but we also include this level of, uh, of person in there. And if you want to say you reject it as a Muslim, you can say that you reject it, but what you can't say is, one, that it's a, con that it's a contradiction, or two, that it's polytheistic any more than saying Allah's mercy triumphs over his wrath would, be, would entail some kind of polytheism. It's just not, you need, we're just clarifying the terms here. And again, the, the, only reason, the only reason we're pointing that out is sometimes you know, Muslims can start throwing up these objections, and you want to get back to what the Bible actually teaches. You can't rule it out on the basis of it being contradictory or polytheistic, so the claim is just, is it true? Because Islam teaches certain things about the Quran being eternal and entering creation in a physical form. Islam teaches things about God being one in one sense and more than one in another sense. Christianity teaches that God is three in person and one in essence or nature. The question is, who's right here? Who has the evidence on our side? And that gets you back to what the Bible claims and, and why we should believe it. I'm going to use an actual about. argument that I did uh, on Peltop. <clears throat> if you guys don't know what Peltop is, something you can download for free from the internet and then you can go into rooms and discuss various topics. I happen to have a room on Peltop called Biblical Monotheism versus Tawheed where I do lectures and answer objections by Muslims against the argument. He was attacking the Trinity on similar grounds that it's a logical contradiction. I said, come on. I go, if anyone wants to talk about logical contradiction, you're the last person to do so. And I go, here's why. And this actually works. I've, I've, again, these are arguments we've used in the field. In fact, how many debates have you had with Muslims? Uh, almost 40. Almost 40. Now, <laughs> beside the fact that he got obliterated in every single debate, and I to, no, I'm kidding. And God has blessed him. He's one of our best guys. So, glory to God. Everything good is from the Lord. Right? And thank the Lord we're not saved by looks because he'd be the last person. <laughs> <laughs> He's scared because he looks nice, but this guy can throw down. So I'm nervous because I got to drive home with him. Mercy, brother, mercy. I told him now, you believe the Quran is uncreated, right? He said definitely. So I said, let me ask you a question: Is the Quran identical to Allah? He goes, no. So the Quran is not Allah, right? No. And yet the Quran is eternal. Yeah. You just told me there are two eternal things: Allah and something that's not Him, the Quran. <laughs> He goes, no, 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 the Quran is part of Allah. Okay, so is it identical with Allah? So would you call it Allah? No. So is it other than Allah? He had to pause. Because if he said it's not Allah, right, then he's positing something other than God as eternal. But if he says it is Allah, that means the Quran exhausts the entire being of Allah. And that's not true. Because the Quran is not all that Allah is. I go, so now welcome to my world, because you have your own paradox and contradiction to deal with. Because of that question, it bothered him for months until he finally gave up that counterfeit, Islam, for the true triune God, the God of the Bible. So these arguments work. What it is is that they're not encountering people who can turn the tables against them, turning the tables against them. So here we're trying to equip you with arguments that work, not to win the argument, that's not our intention, to destroy every obstacle against the gospel of Christ. Whatever obstacle they have, you want to obliterate it for the glory of Christ. Bring down the walls of Jericho in order to take the city captive, and the city is their hearts for the glory of Jesus. That's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, right? We demolish every argument and pretension that sets itself up against Christ, right? And we do it with the weapons that God has given us, which are not carnal. Carnal weapons are used by Muslims. We use weapons created by the Holy Spirit that gives us power to demolish every objection against the glory of Christ. Mm -hmm. So use this argument of the Quran being uncreated. Is it Allah? They'll say no. Is it uncreated? Yeah. So now you have two uncreated entities. Oh, but it's a part of Allah. But it's not Allah. Oh, so Jesus can be God and distinct from God. He is the eternal word who is distinct from God. But because he's an essential part of God's being, it's not two gods, it's one God who's more complex than we can comprehend. So that's what you want to do with them, turn the tables against them. Now if that's, if that's all we have for the presentation, we, can, we got 15 minutes of Q&A. Ask us about anything you heard concerning the deity of Christ, the Trinity, and one of us will answer it by the grace of God. So you got 15 minutes. We'll start over here. Last year I was part of your uh, evidence of the uh, Old Testament. Oh well, yeah, you came yeah. back? That we didn't ever <laughs> talk about because of your social media. Yeah, because of the questions, exactly. Yeah, the questions just kept going. Those breaks up. Uh, so I came back because I want to hear 
Um, some of the evidence from the Old Testament. I love you, man. I was hoping someone would <laughs> ask that question. And by the way, I didn't pay you to come here, right? Correct. <laughs> I didn't well, call you beforehand and tell you ask me a question. Because David does that wherever he goes to make himself look good. So I just want to... <laughs> <laughs> this was predestined for you and me to meet. Right. He's asking me for some of the evidence from the Old Testament proving that God is triune. Now, last year I was assigned the topic Trinity in the Old Testament. But, uh, and David knows I'm infamous for this. You guys know this. When someone asks me a good question, there I go. So by the time I finished the question, my time was up. And we never did justice to the topic. Lord willing, in 15 minutes, we can do miracles. Now, what I want you to do is repent of your Western ways and embrace Middle Eastern time. Because in Middle Eastern culture, when you say 15 minutes, that means to me that's an hour. So are we going 15 minutes American time or Middle Eastern time? This is the time to denounce your Western heritage. <laughs> With the few minutes that I have, let me show you some evidence from the Hebrew Scriptures that the Holy Spirit is truly God and a divine person. Just from the Hebrew Scriptures. Let's start with that. Go to 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 3. Now, I'm going to have someone read these for me. I'll take a few minutes, uh, unless there's other questions. And we got another session, right? No, it's, so, a good, it's a good topic. It's a good topic. Second, uh, uh, Samuel 23, verses 1 to 3. Now, what this is going to do for the Muslim and the Job Witness it's going to demonstrate the supernatural consistency between the Old and New Testaments, right? One of the objections, one of the objections that Muslims often raise against our faith is that our New Testament is opposed to the Old Testament witness. They actually think that the message of the Quran is more compatible with the Old Testament conception of God than the New Testament teaching concerning Jesus being God's Son. If you can show that the Old and New Testaments marvelously agree on this point, that means the Quran becomes the odd man out. So that Muhammad cannot be following in the footsteps of the Old Testament prophets. Because their message agrees with the New Testament contradicting the Quran. Well, that said, 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 3. 2 Samuel 23, verses 1 to 3. Someone read that for me. These are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, speaks. David, the man who was raised up so high, David the man anointed by God, by the God of Jacob, David the sweet psalmist of Israel, the spirit of the Lord speaks through me. Before you move on, David is testifying concerning the inspiration of his words. In other words, it's not simply a New Testament revelation that David was inspired by the Spirit. <clears throat> David is saying that the words I'm writing down, <coughs> the words that I'm proclaiming, were taught to me by the Spirit of Yahweh. Look at verse 2 carefully again. The Spirit of Yahweh speaks by me. His word is on my mouth. Number one, how can the Spirit speak if the Spirit is not a person? Everyone with me? Because Joel's witnesses think the Holy Spirit is, a, is God's active force, right? But here we have David saying, the words I'm speaking, it's the Spirit who's using my mouth to speak. I'm His mouthpiece. And then he says, His word is on my tongue. But now catch verse 3. Watch what happens in verse 3. The God of Israel spoke. I'm really confused. You really confused that God of me. Who spoke, the Spirit or God? But in verse 2, it was the Spirit. Because when the Spirit speaks, God speaks. Something that David knew centuries before the New Testament was written. Did you guys catch it? Yes, sir. The Spirit of God spoke by me. His word is on my mouth. The God of Israel spoke. The rock of Israel said. So David says the Spirit is God speaking. And He speaks through me. He says, give me chills. Even the two follicles I got, they're sticking up too. Go to Isaiah 63. Go to Isaiah 63. I'm going to have to be real quick. Hopefully not too quick where I confuse you guys. Isaiah 63. Let's look at verses 10 to 11 and 14. Well, let's first go to Isaiah 63. By the way, Isaiah 63 from verse 7 all the way down is a Trinitarian passage. You have all three persons of the Godhead represented in that section of Scripture. Isaiah 63. We're going to look at verses 10 to 11. Let's, let's first start with verse 10. Isaiah 63, verse 10. If you want to read, you feel free to read. All right. I like the way you sound. <laughs> you say 10. Yes, verse 10 of Isaiah 63. But they rebelled against him and grieved his Holy Spirit. How do you grieve an active force? You can't. It says that the people of God grieved his Holy Spirit. How do you grieve the Holy Spirit? The Holy Spirit is not a person with emotions. Does someone tell me that? And you find an echo of this in Ephesians 4.30. What did Paul warn the Ephesians? Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of the Spirit by whom you've been sealed. So both Isaiah and Paul believed the Holy Spirit could be grieved because both of them assumed the Holy Spirit is a person with emotions. A divine person with divine emotions. Is that clear? So here you see the Holy Spirit is a person, a divine person. 
But then read verse 11. Then they remembered those days of old when Moses led his people out of Egypt. Mm -hmm. They cried out, Where is the one who brought Israel through the sea with Moses as their shepherd? Where is the one who sent his Holy Spirit to be among his people? Now notice, according to Isaiah, it wasn't just God the Father that led Israel out of Egypt. God's Holy Spirit was also among them, leading them and guiding them. Did you catch that in verse 11? If you don't believe me, just look at verse 11. It's right there. God placed His Holy Spirit among His people. For what purpose? Can someone tell me what was the purpose of God placing His Holy Spirit among the people during the Exodus? Because this is recounting the Exodus. What was the purpose? Lead them by day and night. Lead them, preserve them, right? Sustain them, right? And that's brought out in verse 14. Verse 14. Watch here. As with cattle going down into a peaceful valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. So God placed His Spirit among His people to guide them, to preserve them, and to give them rest. Here's my question for all of you guys. When God is blessed with sharp minds to know His will, and not just know it, but to live it for His glory. Amen? It's not just about head knowledge. It's about living passionately for Jesus Christ. What kind of attributes must the Spirit have in order to take 600,000 men, not counting women and children, and preserve them, sustain them, and give them rest. He must be omnipotent. He must be omniscient. He must be omnipresent. And this is the same chapter that says this same spirit who's omnipotent, omnipresent, can also be grieved. Can the Old Testament be any clearer that the Holy Spirit is a divine person who has all the essential attributes of deity? Now let's go to Psalm 104, 29 and 30. And then I'm going to show you some other passages. This is all about the Holy Spirit for now, but i got other passages. Man, I love this book. Because this book is God's voice speaking to us. So to love the book is to love God. Amen? Amen? God is amazing. Man, if you just study the scriptures, the illumination of the Holy Spirit, you'll sit in awe of this book because you see God's fingerprints all over it. Psalm 104, let's read 29 and 30. Not only is the Holy Spirit the one who gives salvation, gives rest to the people of God. Not only when the Holy Spirit speaks, God speaks because He's the Spirit who is God. Not only can the Holy Spirit be, be grieved, but the Holy Spirit creates and regenerates the entire earth. In Psalm 104, 29 and 30. But if you turn away from them, they panic. When you take away their breath, they die. Actually, in the Hebrew, it's ruach. When you take away their spirit, when you take the spirit from man, what happens to man? It returns to the dust, right? Yeah. That's what it says. But now in verse 30, notice. When he takes their spirit away, they die. But when He sends His Spirit, they live. Because in verse 30, what does it say? When you give them your breath, life is created. Where you give them, your translation says breath? Yeah. It's killing me, this translation. I'll change it. Is it not NIV, not called <laughs> NIV, not inspired version? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Psalm 104, 30 says, yeah, that's, hey, but that's from my King James background days. Forgive me. Right? Aren't we all being sanctified? I mean, come on. He is Jesus. Okay, Psalm 104, 30, what does it say? Uh, when you send forth your spirit, they are created. When God sends His spirit, it results in creating man and renewing the face of the earth. Mm -hmm. What kind of attributes must the spirit have in order to recreate man after he dies and to replenish, regenerate the entire earth? He must be omnipotent, right? Now go to Job 33.4. Now we're going to talk about someone else. You, you, you want evidence for another divine person within a Godhead. Clear as day, the Holy Spirit is God, right? And has the attributes of God. And then literally, we can spend hours. I want to be here for hours. Because it looks like we're torturing you guys. Job 33, verse 4. What does it say? Job 33, verse 4. Now, this was material I was supposed to cover last year. But I'm a year late, so it's all right, right? Better late than never. <laughs> Job 33, verse 4. What does it say? The Spirit of God has made me. Who made Job? Who creates who regenerates, who replenishes, who renews? The Holy Spirit of God. And the breath of the Almighty gives me light. I wish I had time to unpack Job 33.4's relationship to Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. I don't. I wish I did, but I don't have that. So, so, so far you've seen clear evidence that the Holy Spirit is a person who's God. Let's look at other references demonstrating that there's more than one divine person in the Godhead. Go to Zechariah 2.7-11. to Zechariah 2.7-11. Should I just take the reminder, remainder of time on this? You guys want me to just take the remainder of time on this? Yeah. We've only got about three, four minutes, I think. Yeah. We'll finish. Yeah. You got ten? Syrian time? Uh, no, actually, less than ten. Repent! For the kingdom of God is at hand. Right? <laughs> Zechariah 2, 7 to 11. Now, I want you guys to pay attention to the text carefully. Read who's speaking. 
Pay attention because this is going to blow your mind away. These are passages you can use to Orthodox Jews or even secular Jews and Jehovah's Witnesses. Zechariah 2, 7 to 11. Pay attention to the wording carefully. Again, if you don't mind, brother. As long as it's not, it's not the inspired version. Keep it no. going. All right. Switch the ESV. We're here. Okay, read it. Oh, escape to Zion, you who dwell with the daughter of Babylon. As slow as you can because, man, if you read it too fast, you're going to miss it. Go ahead. For thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you, for he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. Keep on. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I come and I will dwell in your midst, declares the Lord. So who sang, I'm going to come and live in your midst? The Lord, right? Rejoice, I'm coming to live in your midst, says the Lord. Don't forget, it's God speaking. Now continue. And many nations shall, shall join themselves to the Lord in that day, mm -hmm. and shall be my people. My people. So it's clearly God speaking, right? Keep going. And I will dwell in your midst, and you shall know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Wait, I'm confused. Mm -hmm. The Lord says, I'm coming to live in your midst. And when I do, then you're, you're going to know that God sent me to live in your midst. Says that too. You guys catch that? Mm -hmm. Awful silence here. I don't know if it's because you're about to sleep or you're just in a state of shock. Here God says, I'm coming to live in your midst. And when I do, then you're going to know that God sent me to you. God sending God? Yahweh sending Yahweh? Yeah. Because the Yahweh who's speaking is Jesus in his pre-human existence telling Zechariah, the Father will send me someday to live in your midst. Do you want me to give you further proof this is Jesus Christ speaking? You want further proof? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. you guys are a bunch of skeptics. You don't believe anything. <laughs> Go to Zechariah 12 verse 10. Let me give you more proof. This is Jesus our Lord in his pre-human existence speaking to Zechariah. I'm going to give you solid proof this is Jesus. Just bear with me. Zechariah 12.10 is talking about the time in which the nations will come and attack Jerusalem. Then Yahweh will give them power to destroy their enemies. And Yahweh is speaking here. What will Yahweh do in the latter days when God gives Israel power to overcome their enemies who want to wipe them off the face of the earth? Verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy. Who's speaking? I will pour out a spirit of grace and supplication or mercy upon all the inhabitants. Who's speaking? God. God, right? But notice what God says about himself. Pay attention. So that when they look on me, on him who they have pierced. Did you catch it? Mm -hmm. Yahweh says, when that happens, they'll look to me, the one they pierced. <laughs> when did Israel pierce their God? <laughs> that day, my people will realize I am the God that they pierced. And when they do, they will mourn and repent, and I will forgive them. <laughs> Partially fulfilled in John 19, 34 to 37, because John, John quotes this. With the, the, the thrust of the spear. John says this was to fulfill. And he quotes Zechariah 12.10. That's in John 19.37. They will look to the one whom they have pierced. And it will be completely fulfilled and realized. When the Lord returns in glory. How do I know? Because Revelation 1.7 says this. Look, he is coming with the clouds. Revelation 1.7. And every eye will see him. Even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth shall mourn. So shall it be. Amen. Jesus is speaking to Zechariah saying, The time will come where my people who pierced me will regret for this sin that they committed against me. This is Jesus our God speaking before he became flesh. Let me give you the final evidence that this is Jesus Christ our Lord speaking to Zechariah. And I can give you more. I can talk about the angel of Yahweh. I can talk about the word of Yahweh. But I don't have time. And I'm excited because this one is really exciting. Zechariah 14, 1 to 5. Same God who says, The time will come where my people will mourn because they pierced me, their God. How could you dare pierce your God when He became flesh and you did not recognize Him? But in the second coming, He doesn't come as a lamb. He comes as a lion of the tribe of Judah in all His splendor and glory. When they see Him then by the Holy Spirit, they're going to know, Oh, that's the one that we've rejected. That's the one who saved us by His grace on the cross. The one we thought He was the curse of God. He's our God and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Blessed are your eyes that you see what you see and your ears that you hear what you hear and believe by the grace of God's Spirit. Zechariah 14, 1 to 5. Now catch this one. This one's going to get really exciting. <clears throat> Behold, a day is coming for the Lord when the spoil taken from you will be divided in your midst. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem to battle, and the city shall be taken, and the houses plundered, and the women raped. Half of the city shall go out into exile, and the rest of the people shall not be cut off from the city. Now before you move on, notice what God is going to do. He's going to move the nations to attack the Jews in Jerusalem. When they do, what will God do then? Watch here. Now watch here. Then the Lord will go out and fight against the, the nations as when he fights on a day of battle. So the Lord's going to come out and fight, right? Now watch what he's going to, where he's going to fight from. It even tells you the location where he's going to fight from. Watch. On that day, his feet shall stand on the Mount of Olives. Whose feet will touch the Mount of Olives? Yeah. Zechariah saying, Yahweh my God will land on the Mount of Olives. And when his feet touches the mount, he'll split it in half from the glory of his feet. That's what he's going to go on to say. Watch. <laughs> See your left, right? Olives that lies before Jerusalem on the east, and the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from the east. You know why? Because even the mount cannot contain the glory of its God. And it's going to split in his presence when his feet land and touches it. I can't wait for that day. Sooner than later. Then you won't have to put up with me and David speaking anymore. Amen? <laughs> Finish. Keep reading. Uh, so that one half of the mount shall be moved northward and the other half southward. Mm -hmm. And you shall flee to the valley of my mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach to Azal. That's right. And you shall flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Now notice verse 5 what he says. Pay attention to this. Then... The Lord my God will come and the Holy Ones with Him. Zechariah says that my God, Yahweh, will come with His Holy Ones. And when He comes, He's going to land on the Mount of Olives and His feet will touch the Mount of Olives. According to Acts 1, 9 to 12, Jesus left from the Mount of Olives. And the angels say that's where He's going to return. Oh my God. That's Acts 1, 9 to 12. This guy freaked out over there. He goes, Whoa. I'm about to enter glory right now because he's about to have a heart attack. <laughs> <laughs> Acts 1, 9-12 Jesus ascended from the Mount of Olives Two men tell the disciples Men of Galilee, why do you gaze up at Jesus? This same Jesus who was taken from you shall return Verse 12 says they returned from the Mount of Olives So Jesus ascended from where? The Mount of Olives. He's going to return the same way Return where? The, Mount of Olives. the feet that Zechariah saw Were the feet of the glorified Christ In his glorified body Coming down with His Holy Ones. That's 1 Thessalonians 3.13. When our Lord Jesus comes with all His Holy Ones. 1 Thessalonians 3.13. So who was Zechariah seeing? When he told Zechariah, I will live in your midst. Then you'll know that God has sent me to you. You will look at me, the one you have pierced. And His feet will touch. He was seeing Jesus in His pre-human existence. Revealing to Zechariah, I, God, will come to dwell in your midst. And the New Testament says, He came once, He's coming again, to the very place that Zechariah said that our God would come, the Lord Jesus Christ. Now because of that, I think my time is up. Oh, I got one minute. Good. Final one. Go to Zechariah, real quickly. Final one. Chapter 3, verse 8 to 9. I wish I had more, more time with you guys to talk about the Trinity in the Old Testament. Right? Zechariah 3, or actually Zechariah 4. Go to Zechariah 4. Chapter 3 is good too, but for, for the sake of time, Zechariah 4, verses 8 to 9. If I had time, I would prove to you by quoting verse upon verse from the Old Testament that the Jews, long before John 1 was written, knew that God had a messenger called the Word. This Word would be sent by God and He would speak to God's prophets as God and a messenger from God. You know when John says in the beginning was the Word? That wasn't new revelation. The Jews before John knew this. If I had time, I'd give you the evidence from Jewish sources outside of the New Testament, such as Philo of Alexandria, who was an Alexandrian Jew. He knew about the Word, the Logos. The Targums that speak about the Word of God, who's a messenger sent from God, who happens to be God. Where were they getting all this information from? They were getting it from the Old Testament. Because in the Old Testament, you have passages where God's Word is sent, and He's a person speaking to God's prophets. Here's one case in point. Zechariah 4, 8-9. Pay attention to the language. Zechariah 4, 
Read that for me. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying... Who came to him? Who's going to be speaking these words? The word of the Lord. The word of the Lord came to me, saying... What does he say? The hands of the Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hand shall also complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. Sent who to whom? The word. The word is saying, look, when this happens, then you will know that the Lord sent me to you. Me, the word, sent by God to you to speak to you. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. Here is Jesus as the word before he became flesh, speaking to the prophets of God. If I had more time, I'd show you the word appearing to Abraham, but I don't have time. Time for lunch. Lord bless you guys. He is risen, risen indeed. Yes.